Thank you for the opportunity to share our latest work. And But before I start, I want to thank the organizers. Guys, you, you did terrific work, and it's very timely uh, workshop, and uh, I think one of very important uh, steps in the field, because as a practitioner in this field of uh, nanoparticle superlattices and assemblies for about two decades now, I kind of feel that as a community, as a field as a community we need to think and probably st do better job strengthening the integration of beautiful functional useful practical so it's a very important circle that we need to uh, keep going around and um, workshops like this especially that bring together chemists physicists are critical okay today I will talk about uh, something some uh, body of work that has been uh, largely based on the papers that we published last year, and I want to use this as an opportunity to emphasize that it was a many-body event <laughs> <laughs> involving uh, great scientists from six different different institutions, and um, I think it allowed us to open to some degree a new chapter of nanoparticle assemblies. To start somewhere, to, uh, well, let me re remind what, we, well, <laughs> to make colloidal assembly, we need colloidal solution. And colloidal solution means that particles should have uh, repulsive pair potentials. There are two ways to implement repulsive potentials. One is steric stabilization, another is electrostatic stabilization. The first works particularly well in, uh, or has been very w well optimized for Non-polar solvents, electrostatic works in polarizable solvents and polar, polar, uh, polarizable media uh, like uh, highly polar solvents. Now, so far, majority of the work, especially that uh, shows these beautiful assemblies, uh, has been done with sterically stabilized particles and uh, DNA stabilized particles, but just I keep it uh, out of discussion because uh, there are people who know the field much better. But so far, if we put aside uh, uh, DNA of work, uh, we, uh, everything that has been done, like in form of beautiful structures, like binary, ternary assemblies, quasi-crystals, has been done using nanoparticles uh, with that uh, sterically stabilized in their colloidal state. And that's, these are amazing structures and they are, Periodic, they are reminiscent of crystals, like um, we often call them after their atomic analogs. And from the early days where these first examples have been demonstrated, the feeling was that, hey guys, it's probably an opportunity to completely rethink condensed matter sciences in terms of band structure engineering, electronic structure engineering. We can make now these materials with, from many functional building blocks like a semiconductor, magnet, um, plasmonic materials, uh, we can put together different building blocks like uh, uh, magnet uh, and semiconductor. Okay, let them uh, talk uh, to each other in the same way as atoms would, uh, and mole molecules would talk in normal crystals, forming uh, extended electronic strands, uh, states, bands, and so on and so on. And that was our feeling that we are right on, uh, around 2006 that we are right on the verge of rethinking how solids can be made and engineered. And it didn't happen yet. Now the problem as I see it uh, is um, that uh, not about particles, not about their assemblies, they are really impressive, but about the coupling strands between individual building blocks. So typically with traditional chemistries that uh, Rob was talking about DNA chemistries, our chemistries with just uh, hydrocarbon ligands. The, each building blocks, uh, each particle is separated with a bilayer of chicken fat uh, that pretty much <laughs> localizes electronic states on individual uh, units, individual particles, and electrons can occasionally hope, but uh, from particle to particle if we apply electric field, but forget about the chance to retain phase of the wave function and so on. So it's just completely incoherent transport. So uh, there were numerous attempts made to, in order to uh, improve coupling strengths between particles, and one of these approaches that uh, 
probably provided best, uh, so far highest uh, coupling strengths uses inorganic ligands. Where instead of using organic ligands, we uh, use different ions uh, uh, or groups, uh, inorganic groups attached to the particle surfaces that provide colloidal stability. And after you dry, after you evaporate solvent, you end up with all inorganic assembly where particles are integrated, let's say, in, in a calcogenite, in a thin layer of, uh, or separated by thin layer of calcogenite glasses or other uh, uni um, matrix or medium that has uh, high dielectric constant, so it uh, lowers uh, uh, charging energy, it uh, more polarizable, and so on. And, and this type of material showed the highest carrier mobilities, uh, showed the highest uh, uh, performance in solar cells or photodetectors. So, so far, I think if we, given the chemistry that we have in hand, the best way to achieve strong coupling is to go with inorganic ligands. But the problem is that inorganic ligands uh, exclusively result in, uh, create colloidal solutions uh, with st uh, electrostatic stabilization. And we arrived at an interesting, pe peculiar situation where if we think about order or size of the order domains on one end and the strengths of the coupling on the other hand, we have two kind of orthogonal avenues of development. We can make gorgeous structures. We can put together something like of a, a, billion, a billion different particles into a single crystalline domain. But the coupling strands, and now uh, when I'm talking about coupling strands, uh, one way to express it is to model nanoparticle superlatives as a resistive network. So it's a resistive network, and then we can measure what the resistance is, what each particle particle contact resistor uh, is in terms of units of the quantum Landauer quantum conductance. So in that case, we have, uh, well, if the strength is on the order of unity, we expect a transition from weak coupling to the strong coupling region. So for uh, for particles with for superlates with traditional organic ligands, the coupling strengths will be on the order of 10 to the minus 10 uh, uh, quantum conductance. With inorganic ligands, we can go beyond unity, and there are several demonstrations of strong coupling regime, but there is no, <laughs> no ordering whatsoever. And so we, as of very recently, we didn't have a possible way to have self-assembled structures with electrostatically stabilized particles. Now the question, why? And that has been actually recognized and, uh, and uh, studied by theorists and biologists because this type of problems is closely related, related to uh, crystallization of globular proteins. So if you look at Leonard John's colloid, and it's, uh, and I'm here following the uh, concepts put forth by Dan Frankel in late 90s, the uh, phase diagram, equilibrium phase diagram, will be a classical phase diagram with a critical point, gas, liquid, and solid. And first, just as a sidestep, for me, intuitively, it's very, when I think about uh, argon, it would be very intu intuitive to think about argon as a solid, argon as a gas, and argon as a liquid. Colloidal particles in many ways are similar, they similar type of uh, potentials. But when we talk about colloids, colloidal solutions in statistical thermodynamic language, they are gas. And then we have solids. Where are colloidal liquids? And that's, I think, one of the future, uh, I think, in, in new directions for colloidal science that probably worth thinking about. But coming back to our crystallization. So this, for Leonard Jones colloids, there is a very small region where we can have a crystalline uh, uh, structures and that, are, that is very difficult to find. And also what is not uh, captured by uh, um, equilibrium phase diagram is kinetic aspect. And uh, it is shown, for example, by mode coupling series that the, all the bottom of this phase diagram is will lead to glasses. Now, uh, for uh, protein crystallization community, it has been realized that the way to go is to generate collo uh, colloids with very short uh, attractive potentials. Where, uh, and in that case, the phase diagram changes 
from this familiar way, it's, it's similar a little bit for water, for example, and uh, into a different one where there are two, only two stable phases, fluid and gas and solid. And as a, a legacy of this uh, critical point and this binodal line, we have a metastable binodal line with a critical point that is shifted inside into the fluid solid uh, phase below the uh, gas uh, region. Now, uh, the, it, it was recognized by Frankel that the sweet spot for crystallization, it, it has been confirmed in, in gazillion of uh, successful experiments on protein crystallization, that sweet spot is close to this critical point where you have large critical fluctuations and you have, uh, uh, you can efficiently nucleate your structures. Now, uh, still uh, another important point, so in the vicinity of this critical point, we can use uh, um, the, the physics of corresponding states and we can map any potential, any pair potential on another pair potential through the second virial coefficient. And, the, uh, and as a result, we can uh, kind of ignore the exact shape of the pair potentials and model them as a square well potential with uh, particular depths and particular, particular widths. Now the widths gives us the type of the universality class where, where this critical uh, point will be located with respect to the fluids uh, uh, like uh, liquidus line. And the, in this case, if the uh, critical, if the uh, range of the sphere of the square potential is smaller than about 20% of the particle radius, uh, we will be in this uh, type of uh, phase diagrams that are optimal for crystallization. Now the question, is it even possible to, for nanoparticles to have a potential well that is on the order of one uh, nanometer range? And that's, that's a very important question. It's, it's too small, uh, just almost unphysical. So to, and we don't have a good way to probe pair potentials for nanoparticles. So one way to just even touch upon this problem is to just do DLVO analysis. It's Minfield crude, it for sure doesn't work at the sub nanometer scales. And, but it allows us to kind of look at the approximate scaling of the electrostatic repulsion and double layer and Van der Waals forces. And, Surprisingly, so if we put if we put numbers for gold nanoparticles, for example, five nanometer diameters, in a highly asymmetric like one three electrolyte of different concentrations, we will see that these two uh, branches of uh, double layer repulsion and Van der Waals attraction cancel each other surprisingly well. So each of these branches is very uh, long, long ranged and cannot be uh, give us this required narrow attractive well that we would need. Uh, for this type of phase diagram, but all together, together they cancel each other and give us potentially a right, poten right type of potential with lambda, which is effective width of if we shave map it or, or, on a square well potential uh, of 0 0.1. So far, <clears throat> so good, but again, it's, this is a very crude uh, approximation. How can we touch upon it? How, how, how can we test it if we are in that regime? So, if you revisit the space diagrams for, and look, take a slice of it. <clears throat> so at a given temperature, and here temperature is reference to the depth of the potential well. So we just scale it in, in terms of how deep the well is with respect to KBT. At equilibrium, we, we must have two phases, three phases, two, well, at quasi-equilibrium, two metastable, metastable low density fluid, metastable high density fluid, and solid. And if we take lead sulfide nanoparticles uh, with uh, uh, size 10, 8 ligands and let it sit, that's what we form. So we form indeed three phases and, uh, and they, they ex can stay for at least 24 hours, sometimes longer. So, and we uh, speculate that this is uh, colloidal gas, well, this is low uh, concentration branch, this is high concentration branch, and this is stable solid. Um, and that follows also from um, smaller angle X-ray scattering data. Now it's, uh, we can also take another, make another cut through this phase diagram looking at different uh, temperatures or that we also can change by uh, control by changing concentration of uh, 
free ligands. And indeed, it looks like we, we go down this, we are slicing, taking different slices, and it qualitatively agrees with what we should expect. So we indeed here formed a colloidal fluid that uh, looks like an interesting type of colloidal, uh, well, <laughs> new, new state of colloidal systems in many ways. And uh, also, what is in equilibrium with this material is, with this phase, is uh, crystalline nanoparticles. Uh, nanoparticle, well, colo crystalline colloidal assemblies of electrostatically stabilized particles. So just, uh, so far so good, but we came across very, several, three puzzles that kind of were keeping us uh, awake for a long time. First of all, if we have like, we know, well, all, uh, well, we uh, can routinely form colloidal uh, uh, assemblies if we used highly asymmetric, highly charged electrolytes or where uh, like multiple charged ions, like in this case, it, uh, TN2 S6 4 minus, uh, arsenic S4 3 minus, but all attempts to mimic, to replicate these conditions using 1 1 electrolytes like uh, sodium nitrate, sodium chloride, even if we match ionic strands, led nowhere. Always disordered structures. Second, we uh, empirically found in many, many experiments that metals give us easily superlattices. All of the experiments until recently uh, with dielectric particles gave us glasses or gels or, uh, or fractal frame networks of particles and uh, like DLA. And if we think about it, uh, these observations using this phase diagram, it looks like metals emerge as a, at a high effective temperature in colloidal, which is totally opposite to my common sense because the Hamaka constants for metals are larger than the Hamaka constants for uh, dielectrics and it should be just opposite. The third experimental uh, puzzle that we, we saw that if we use this, if, if we have particles and these are the ligands and also electrolytes and then we can isolate particles and uh, measure their chemical compositions and it looks like when there is much larger number of ligands associated per unit surface area of metal nanoparticles compared to all what we have seen for dielectric particles. So and the difference can be factor of five or so. So it, it, again, it was puzzling. It definitely doesn't, is not captured by DLVO or any other analysis. But luckily, uh, Monica Olvera de la Cruz worked for many years on understanding um, um, electrostatics beyond a standard, uh, well, DLVO treatments. And we found, we connected with them and, and learned from their works the importance of image charges. So now the dial, it turns out that if you have particle, if you have metal nanoparticles, so particles with very high dielectric constant, and you have highly charged ions in close proximity to the surface, there will be, in addition to st standard interactions, there will be also image charge contribution that will result in the condensation of uh, highly charged ions at the nanoparticle surfaces. And it can even, their computational data shows that this condensation can even go beyond a monolayer. So you form a really like a blanket of ions, several layers of ions around particles with high dielectric constant, and that will be not present in case of particles with low dielectric constant. And as, and they agreed with our experimental data, with our experimental observations, just chemical analysis, and also, uh, they calculated uh, the, how it would impact this, uh, this multi-layer of charges, um, how would it contribute to the pair potentials. And it introduces an additional strong, rather strong repulsive component to the pair potentials that brings metals up uh, the temperature, effective temperature, and, and allows us to enter the uh, right region of the phase diagram, and it all, encoded in ion correlations and something that really is not captured by standard uh, electrolyte models. And, but we see it in simulations. So in the absence of image charges, the short, short range attraction between nanocrystals and electrostatically stabilized colloids 
too strong and we allow, form glasses, in presence of image charges, we can uh, model the crystallization. And indeed, these predictions mapped very well on our experimental observations. Well, as usual, experiments have been done first, and then we try to make a nice story to understanding what we, we were doing. Uh, but you can make gold nanoparticle, for example, assemblies, and uh, if we compare the super lattices with traditional ligands versus inorganic ligands, the surface-to-surface -surface distances are about three to four angstroms. It is very important and uh, impactful for particle, uh, uh, for, this, for the strands of coupling, as you will see later. But also it works for many materials, so it can work for many different metals. So everything that could be made in form of uniform nanoparticles, nickel, palladium, gold, uh, form crystals, and it can work for all kinds of calcogenida methylate ligands. And here I want to point your attention to one exception to our dialectic business, lead sulfide. We were able to crystallize lead sulfide after we realized the importance of dialectic uh, uh, effects. And why lead sulfide? Because lead sulfide has dialectic, static dielectric constant of 170, very unusual. Typical cadmium selenide would have 10. And also, lead selenide works. It has also a very high dielectric constant, around 230. For small nanoparticles, we typically, typically structures are FCC. For small nanoparticles, we occasionally saw inter, uh, more complex phases that resembled Frank Casper sigma phase. And HCP structures, again, very interesting kind of work for, for the future. But let me revisit back. So uh, revisit the story with lead sulfide. And um, we spent a lot of time trying to crystallize other dielectric particles, something like cadmium selenide. Zero success. Lead sulfide, well, okay, yes, I, I, I saw textbooks. I, I know what dielectric constant of lead sulfide is. But as a chemist, kind of my chemical intuition is a bit re re resistant to this because um, I... I don't know, uh, well, uh, these materials appear to be not so different, but actually, very recently we did, we did iron layering reconstruction from, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know. So what is it for the four nanometer? I am familiar with work from Lou Bruce, uh, who did uh, EFM measurements uh, on nanoparticles and claimed uh, of lead selenide and claimed that it's above 100. That's uh, those particles were charged. No. no, no, not to my knowledge. But well, the jury is out. I I I don't know. It's again, these are experimental data, and I'm a bit puzzled by by the um, magnificence of this effect myself. But for lead sulfide, we can see, uh, so there is a method called double differential uh, pair distribution function analysis, where you can see uh, uh, correlations induced in solution by the presence of surfaces. And this method has been used by others and, and us for some other projects uh, to reconstruct, to see what happens if there is any layering of ions next to the surfaces. And these are comparison of lead sulfide and cadmium selenide nanoparticles of comparable size with comparable ions. There is quite an effect. So there are multiple layers of uh, uh, cyostanate ions in that uh, kind of packing around lead sulfide, most likely, probably because of dielectrics, dielectric effects. But they must be charged. Yeah, now they're, everything is charged, yeah. OK. And uh, so. We, uh, well, this class of uh, colloidal systems, uh, just due to its close relation to the protein crystallization, has been studied extensively, experimental, or theoretically, and there were predictions that depending where you are on the phase diagram of the ra range of the potential, the bits of the potential, and depth of the potential, you can enter regimes where the system will prefer to nucleate through one-step nucleation or two-step nucleation. So do not nucleate at all or form a glass. And we uh, try, we did these studies uh, together with uh, David Lehman, Naomi Ginsberg, and their groups. And we uh, showed that indeed we see this transition from one step, well, data from one step nucleation to two step nucleation. 
For example, if we have a phase diagram where we have a depth of potential and volume concentration of particles, we can identify regimes where the nucleation occurs where from analysis fitting of the small angle X-ray scattering data, we can very nicely see that no liquid phase is involved in the, nucle in the transition from pure colloid, colloidal gas to colloidal solid. So you just nucleate uh, particles through traditional one-step classical nucleation theory. But if you slightly increase the depth of the potential, exactly as predicted by the modeling for short-range uh, potential colloids with short-range potential well, uh, we will start forming, in order to feed, quantitatively feed small angle X-ray scattering data, we need to introduce the concept of colloidal fluid that precedes the nucleation. So we use Perkus-Yevick uh, type structure factor to model the colloidal fluids. And then you can, you can see this interplay of the dynamics of uh, formation of colloidal fluid, nucleation of crystals in, in this fluid phase, and how colloidal gas transforms into colloidal fluid. And you can see also that if you, if your strength of your potential, the depth of your potential well is too deep, you can uh, also you enter in the regime where the crystallinity is compromised and you form more like a glass, colloidal glass. Now, uh, well, beyond that, you, we've been puzzled, and that's another question like that is uh, out there. Uh, so in or, uh, traditional nanoparticle superlattices, organic, la organic layer for, plays a role of like elastic cushion that uh, smoothens all kinds of structural imperfections of the cores. Here, we don't have this cushion. Like for gold, okay, I, I can uh, think that, okay, my gold is already spherical enough and uh, mono dispersed, but lead sulfide is faceted. So it looks a bit chunky, but it's faceted. And in these super lattices, especially that have been grown uh, with good care, we see amazingly good alignment of electronic, uh, of not only, particle, not only particle positions, but particle orientations. So it's really like a three-dimensional epitaxial network of, of structures. And that is, well, yeah, it's kind of true supercrystal. But now so, uh, let me quickly move to the last part. Like, and so I started with this discussion of that uh, colloidal, that order and coupling have been always kind of orthogonal to each other. And we did all this work uh, with the hope to break this uh, kind of trade-off, and now how, how do these structures act in terms of coupling strands? So the first, optically, we can uh, assess the degree of coupling from uh, reflectance or NK analysis, and for traditional gold nanoparticles, a so gold nanoparticle super lattice with dot decay inside, you, the optical response will be dominated by surface uh, localized, uh, localized surface plasma resonances, spherical modes, the peak at 520 something nanometers, at least for individual particles. In these uh, arrays of uh, when we have all inorganic nanoparticle assemblies, we are much closer to the re response of bulk gold. So these materials are, have really like luster in color, they, they look like gold. And um, so it means that uh, electronic, uh, electronics, uh, well, electrons are moving across the interfaces with the frequency of electromagnetic wave quite efficiently. From the transport, so it's, so we clearly saw classical, like all, all the boring bloch grunson model for the phonon scattering related, uh, well, uh, uh, resistance in these structures as we go to the low temperature. So these objects are very deeply on the metal side of the metal insulator transition. And their uh, uh, conductivity, and that's, probably a uh, conservative estimate is a factor of 30 or so lower that, than textbook resistance of, specific resistance of bulk gold. But probably the coolest part of all this, because uh, there is, a, you can always ask me whether these materials, these structures could sinter during the assembly, is that we can make this crystal, we can measure, cool it down to four Kelvin, measure this classical scaling uh, of metallic resistance, take it out, redissolve it, compare uh, uh, dynamic light scattering of 
pre-assembly and re-dissolved particles that we know they, they are metals. And they, they, they are there, so it's, it's fully reversible. So if, if we now map these numbers on the pairwise coupling, it's, it's very close to 1,000 qu uh, quantum conductance quanta per each particle-particle contact. So these are, they are metals. Now, so we, to, to sum up, so it's probably the first example of system that has long range order, has strong coupling, and it has like two hierarchical structuring, so that you have one set of reflections uh, coming from the super lattice scattering, second uh, set of reflections coming from the atomic scattering. So for each particle, you should have a Fermi surface, and for the super lattice, there should be another Fermi surface inside. So it's just really, truly hierarchical structures. And now if you look at these land scales, these land scales are very similar to the land scale or modulation uh, of potential scales uh, for more uh, uh, twisted bilayer graphene, for example, pattern. So it's kind of a 3D structure. So I think it's, it's pretty interesting from the uh, hard condensed matter physics uh, perspective. And to finish, I want to ask a question. That, and that puzzled me, and I don't know, we don't have an answer. Maybe it's indeed a perfect venue to ask it. Uh, does metallicity play any role during self-assembly process? Why am I asking this? Well, you see, if, if the crystal as a whole, the material that grows, is a dielectric, it means that every time we have any perfect imperfections of positive charges and negative charges throughout the structure, we need to pay penalty. If it is a metal, if it is on, on metallic sides of this quantum phase transition, we, we can, uh, charges will be very efficiently screened, and any imperfections in having two ions here and one ion here, or something of in, uh, disorder in positive and negative charges will just mag magically disappear. And this will definitely, stabil well, will definitely stabilize the structure, lower its uh, free energy. The question is how important this effect. And this can be an interesting link natural link between soft and hard uh, condensed matter kind of sciences. And now let me, well, I, first I want to acknowledge my group, my funding agencies that supported these <laughs> bits and pieces throughout many years, but the most important, uh, I really want to acknowledge people who put their, in the, and, <laughs> Their years of their life, professional life, into working on these uh, different aspects of this project that lasted for a number of years. I want to thank my collaborators and thank you for your kind attention. Thanks for a very amazing talk. Uh, I will make a quick question um, since I am the organizer, I can, um, <laughs> which is that, um, so what is the status of semiconductor nanoparticles at this point? I mean, you seem that, uh, it seems like you've been able to crystallize them or not? We could crystallize lead sulfide and lead selenide, and uh, it, they form three-dimensional crystals. Where we are currently a bit got stuck is that we need efficient feedback to, um, be able to measure properties of these materials uh, to optimize surface trapping and, and, and do this type of work. So typically, uh, well, uh, for thin films, we can do field effect transistor measurements, hole measurements, all this arsenal I'm very familiar with, but for 3D crystals, we probably need to rely on transient microwave reflectivity or other methods for fast uh, throughput feedback. So if anybody is willing to, <laughs> to help, we are very interested. Yeah, that's, that's, I think, what we would need to fully understand what semiconductor structures are capable of. Okay, yeah. Uri. Um, thank you, Dimitri. So uh, what is the dependence on the dielectric constant? Is it sharp? I mean, is there an onset? Is it gradual? What kind of dielectric constant do you think is needed to realize this, A? And have you been able to do the same trick of read the solution also on the lead sulfide, or, or that kind of does make some bridges when you make a, a, a call the crystal? Um, excellent questions. Uh, for the first question, and I will return to it, I, the best answer, I don't know, but I'll, I'll comment a little bit. About the dissolution, yes, lead sulfide redissolves. 
And I think the redissolution is very important. There, there is another very credible and very powerful attempt, uh, and Tobias is one of uh, people who is spearheading spear this direction of just making uh, assembling particles into extended structures and then making them epitaxially by epitaxial bridges. Um, and uh, it's a great approach, but I think one of limitations of it is irreversibility of the necking. And here we, so to the, yeah, lead sulfide can be redissolved, uh, at least freshly prepared. Uh, now, um, with your first question, I, there are many unknowns, and there are many puzzling parts here because even, well, so what matters is the dielectric constant, cons, uh, dielectric mismatch at the uh, sol nanoparticle uh, uh, solvent interface. What is uh, the dielectric constant of, uh, of uh, DMF, dimethylformamide, right next to the surface? It's definitely not bulk, but, and for water, it, it, has, it took decades to figure out that water next to interface has a dielectric constant of around 10, if not lower. So that's, there is this, so it, it will be an exploration to put true quantitative stamp on what's going on, how these interactions work. And uh, it's, and also we don't have uh, easy, an easy knob to control uh, the electric constant of the, of this semiconductor. So we have one camp like cadmium selenide, silicon, gallium arsenide around 10, lead calcogenides hundreds. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of many systems that would be in between of this. And to make this even more complicated, what frequency should I think of? It's, it's definitely, it's not static, it's probably microsecond, maybe nanosecond dynamics. What is, so that's, uh, probably again, the electric constant needs to be corrected a little bit for the frequency component. Great, uh, thanks, Vijay. That was a brilliant talk, Re really, really great. I, I love the, the direction you. of these sort of you know, small molecule charge ligands. I think there's a lot of really interesting stuff there. Um, my question, so, is a little bit more speculative then. So, uh, one of the things you mentioned at the very beginning was that in any of these assembly processes, you always end up with interfaces, and in terms of properties, interfaces just kill everything, uh, um, whether it's electrical or phonon or whatever. Um, so, my, my question would be, with this new chemistry of a charge ligand, does that open up new possibilities for post-processing to sinter or calcine or pyrolyze these things to actually get a more fused system? Um, is that something you've investigated? Are there new possibilities to do that chemically or electrochemically or in other methods with this charged ligand species? Well, yeah, thank you. It's an excellent question. And yes, it, it allows us to eliminate, well, to kind of do sintering much more controllably or, or doping during sintering. So we did, we, we published our first uh, paper on this uh, like early this year, I think, or la very late last year. Uh, it's where we compare sintering dynamics in different semiconductor materials with inorganic ligands, and it definitely makes it much more controllable and deterministic compared to what we have, we always experienced with uh, organic ligands. Uh, but again, it just, we just scratched the surface. There is a lot of clever work that uh, can be done and should be done in that space. Dimitri, great, great talk. Um, so uh, my question, what is the significance, if you can comment, of local arrangement of particular crystalline symmetry of particles in respect to the function? So from point of view on your plot, as a coupling is kind of sufficient, but uh, I mean, spherewise coupling, but if I have potentially one lattice versus another, how it's going to be reflected in the uh, electronic properties? That's question number one. And question number two, if you consider somehow using ions as a doping to manipulate electronic properties of kind of collective electronic properties. Um, let's start with the first one. No, it, it's, it's very important to be kind of realistic and self-critical about this, this aspect. And uh, with crystal, well, if we are uh, in the uh, hopping regime, in the weak coupling regime, there, the only number that matters is kind of density or that is also would be related to the number of nearest neighbors. The sites you hop in from to hop in to. And for isotropic, for spherical particle, the difference between to totally uh, amorphous and totally crystalline structures will be different, will be not too large, maybe a factor of 
so, well, maybe 25 percent or so. Now for, and actually amorphous films have advantage, can have advantages because they are isotropic compared to a polycrystalline films. So that's why it's much easier to make re re reproducible uh, devices, for example, thin film transistors or photodetectors using amorphous structures. Uh, as we are moving from a uh, weak coupling into a strong coupling regime, it's totally unexplored territory. I, uh, well, so there we will have uh, just, we, we will have all aspects of con hard condensed metaphysics that we all know from textbooks how it will play out uh, in uh, these macroscopic structures. My biggest hope is that it will allow us to mix the electronic states where uh, super lattices will make sense will be not just the brute conductivity, but mixing of electronic states of the components. That's, that's my speculation, but again, it needs to be shown. About using um, ions for doping, yes, it works. You can do charge transfer doping for, especially for semiconductor structures. Here, for metals like adding an electron, subtracting an electron, does not contribute too much on how many electrons you have within the Fermi window. Yes, uh, so first uh, a short comment. Uh, I find it amusing that in a sense in this uh, ana analogy between chemistry and colloidal science, your uh, assembly of metallic particles is an analog of metallic bond, right? Because they use all this uh, delocal delocalized ions essentially to, to keep the structure. But anyway, so my question is uh, again back to semiconductors. Uh, just how much conductivity you think you need to go into this uh, assembly mode? Uh, can you use the regular doping of the semiconductors to, uh, uh, to, to, to basically to mimic this? And metallic behavior? Well, this uh, story has deep roots uh, and uh, about band like transport in, in quantum dot solids. It's, uh, it depends, and there, there are some interesting claims by, made by great people, like, for example, if we talk about true, well, well, it's, it's, it's a loaded question. So <laughs> let's, if we talk about met metal, true metal, you need to satisfy mod criterion. And that would require about five, six uh, electrons per quantum dot minimum, just, just, just to, to, to fulfill. But when we talk about mod criterion and metallicity, it means that conductivity at zero Kelvin. I need to be very careful uh, saying this in physics uh, at the Institute of Theoretical Physics, but who cares about zero Kelvin when it comes to practical devices? <laughs> So uh, there, is, there is a big question uh, about what happens uh, at um, like round room temperature and what degree of delocalization has. Our current understanding is that even with current ligands and very well controlled systems, uh, we can already delocalize over hundreds of, uh, well about 100 particles, quantum dots, uh, but, and, and what limits us is microstructure. So as soon as uh, we have micro cracking or like the size of the crystal of the domains, coherent domains, uh, is defined by, by how the micro cracking, microstructuring, or density fluctuations uh, uh, play out in the film, in the solid. So pr from this point of view, long range ordering and structures like this made out of semiconductor nanocrystals can be a game changer. Okay, so Gerard. Um, beautiful talk. Um, Thank you. So um, I've got a question. The stabilization of your um, um, super lattice depends on uh, multivalent ion correlations, right? But in your system, you have such strong dielectric contrast between the solvent and the particles that you would expect significant deformation of field lines and so forth. So what do you think happens to these, counter these multivalent ion correlations? When you have confinement and distortion of field lines, do you get weaker correlation effects, stronger correlation effects? I have, I didn't think about it. It's, it's a good point. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know. I, I really, well, it's kind of easy to think when you have a particle and infinite solutions, their kind of intuition works more or less reasonably. Uh, but when it comes like, for example, how would, what do ions feel when they are seated right in the middle and perfectly screened, 
I don't know. And the question also that uh, I've been puzzled about, what have, if, if the, this structure is globally a metal, so it means that probably electrostatics is completely ir uh, or nearly completely irrelevant inside the crystal. So probably all the imperfections are somehow accounted uh, for by uh, some uh, charge, uh, well, charging of the surface of the, of the super lattice as a whole. But that's, that's a pure speculation and probably a right speculation to make in this room. So maybe you guys can put numbers to it and prove me wrong or, or maybe not. Okay, Chiao Ming. Yeah, this is a quick follow-up question. I think you partially have answered it. So I'm, I'm curious about the Fermi surface in Fermi surface picture you showed. So that requires quantum coherence of the wave function across different particles. Can you comment on like how, how good an approximation that is? We, uh, well, we know, uh, well, we can recalculate it in terms of mean free pass. And that will be uh, definitely will satisfy the uh, uh, Motiofi-Riegel uh, uh, criterion. So they, it means that electrons can cross the surfaces uh, uh, coherently. Well, uh, all other things are still need to be worked out quantitatively. Yeah, thank okay. you. Okay, so um, I want to say one thing, which is that we only are halfway, and I think that some of the talk we've had here, people will still be watching 20 years from now. So <laughs> no pressure to the other speakers, <laughs> but uh, we will get back at 11, and now let's have some scones. Okay. <laughs>